You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich and Rish Outfield. Cheers, gents. Welcome to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. Volume 1, number 4, page 87. I am your host, Sir Reginald Outfield III. And I'm Bigglesby Anklevich Esquire. Pretty much all the English we know, isn't it? <laughs> Pretty much. Today's story is Japanese Motorcycle Club by Michael Stone, a sequel to Lonely Heart Club, an episode we did uh, February 21st, 2009. So if you haven't heard that one, or you'd like to be all caught up, run back and check it out. Yeah. Michael Stone was born in 1966 in Stoke-on-Trent, England. Since losing most of his eyesight to Usher Syndrome, he has retreated from your world to travel the dark corners of inner space. To put it more prosaically, he thinks, what if? A lot. The signs are clear to those who know him well, for his one good eye glazes over, and he is rendered deaf to all English except for... Would you like a cup of tea, Mike? He will then engage with reality long enough to ask if there are any biscuits before submerging again. He imagines this can be very trying for those around him, but remains unrepentant. His vanity has a name, www.myleftei.net. Would you like a cup of Mike? Japanese Motorcycle Club by Michael Stone. I scrambled along the highest branch that would bear my weight and gazed down on the heavenly body of Catherine Hewson. Sunlight splintered on the stream, lending a pleasant, gauzy quality to the vision. Her auburn hair glowed as if she wore a halo. She lifted the hem of her cotton dress and waded out into the current, the water chuckling as it caressed her knees. Plucking an acorn... I let it plop into the current, and then another. Plop! Soon a flotilla of nuts bobbed around her thighs. She shielded her eyes and glanced up. Leonard, what are you doing up there? Just climbing. She graced me with a glorious smile, before going back to a contemplation of river life. Courting Catherine had knocked ten years off me. I was like a teenager again. Today, on our country walk, as well as climbing trees... I had taken great delight in skimming flat stones across a crystal-clear lake, dammed a narrow brook with clods of earth before tearing it down, gathered pine cones for a fire, and whittled our names on a fallen tree. I performed without a trace of self-consciousness. A tiny red pig with horns and a pointy tail strutted along the branch above my head and squatted so his eyes were level with mine. He gazed down on my beloved and licked his snout. Wow, Linny! You're one lucky guy. You don't have to tell me that, Club. So why haven't you pair got round to doing the horizontal jigger jig yet? You're 26 and still a virgin, living at home with his mum and dad. Some folks might say that's a bit peculiar. My sub-vocalizing went up an octave. I'll have you know that this relationship is founded on companionship, mutual respect and friendship and... And mutual respect. That's all right, then. Very important things, those. He held up a trotter. Seriously, I'm agreeing with you. Especially mutual respect. I had been 14 years of age when Klob came into my life. My mum took me to see a child psychiatrist named Dr. Wilson, who simplified the thoughts of Sigmund Freud as thus... The old Siggy believed that the psychic structure comprised the superego, the ego, and the id. The superego is your conscience, all those values that you inherit from society and your parents. The id is your basic drives, your instincts for hunger, desire, revenge, pleasure, etc. And finally, we have your ego in the middle. The part of you which strives to balance out the one against the other. The id versus the superego. Wilson, the psychiatrist, speculated that my id, 
due to feelings of guilt at natural prurience, perhaps, had manifested itself as a porcine imp. Wilson advised me never to ignore Clob. He is a part of you, Lenny. Reason with him, argue with him, but ignore your instincts at your peril. He needn't have bothered. To my regret, my id was impossible to ignore. Catherine bent down to examine a shiny pebble. What a peach! Clop observed. Firmer and smoother than a peach, actually. More like a nectarine. <laughs> Clop snorted. Why don't you admit that you're dying to give her one? I don't deny it. Gagging for it! Yes, I think we've established that. Positively dripping, I suspect. I'm not sure what you mean, I said miserably. But yes, I probably am. So why haven't you done something about it? I looked down on Catherine. I've dropped one or two subtle hints. We kiss and cuddle, but when things get more serious, she goes all coy. We are basically two very shy people. I don't want to push it and risk spoiling what we've got. A problem is all this man, that one. What you need to do is come across as something of a Lothario, and then she'll have the confidence to let you take the lead. Climbing trees is not impressing her, Lenny. I think you're a bit old for that kind of tactic. Do you think so? I could write her a poem, I suppose. We thought about this in silence, gazing out across the vista before us. The sky was an upturned bowl of wedgewood blue. Over the slopes below and on the hillsides opposite, herds of witch elms grazed with sycamores while the proud Scots pine stood aloof in pairs and threes. And down there... In the green velvet basin of the valley, a river threaded its way through the alders like an errant strand of white cotton. Roses are red, violets are blue, Clob sighed. <sighs> Forget it! Xavier's just bought a motorbike, I said, as much to change the subject as anything else. I had once considered Xavier Capdeville my major rival for Catherine's affections, and still took an insecure interest in his movements. He's traded his car in for it. He looks a bit silly, if you ask me. It's too big for him. My dad had an expression for this kind of thing. He called it looking like a tomtit on a round of beef. Mum would chide him for using such language in the house, despite all his protests that a tomtit wasn't the naughty kind of tit. What sort of bike is it? Clob asked. A Harley Davidson. A Harley's a pussy magnet, Lenny. Well known fact. Guys with big choppers are always popular with the chicks. He sat up. Hey! No, I said. No way, Jose. I know what you're going to say. And the answer's no. Not a chance. Why not? You've got a full motorbike license, haven't you? Technically, but I've never ridden anything bigger than a 90cc Honda step-through. Clob donned a pair of mirror shades and a black helmet in the style known to motorcyclists the world over as a piss pot. He made throttle-twisting motions in the air. Come on, Lenny, my man. We was born to be wild. Wild, Leo. Take note of what I am saying here. Clob crouched down on the headlamp dish and flipped the collar on his leather jacket. He began to yodel. Born to be mild. Leo. He only calls me that when he feels I don't deserve the implied grandeur. It's like when a politician begins a sentence, With all due respect, you just know what he really means is, You, sir, are an insufferable arse. Give me a break, pig. I fluffed another gear change and the bike lurched like a drunken Rottweiler. A bus overtook us. Teenagers made rude noises out of the back window. Clop jabbed a V sign at them, a cloven hoof being perfectly shaped for that kind of thing. Safe and steady wins the race, I said in reply to Clob's baleful glare. I'm surprised you didn't say, they won't get there any quicker. He delivered it in a perfect mockery of my mum's voice. You talk like I should be ashamed of riding slow. Well, I'm not, so there. Although I was, and Clob knew that only too well, on account of him being a porcine representation of my id. Well, maybe I could go a teeny bit quicker. I twisted the throttle and the bike surged forward. The bus went past in a blur, as did several cars, a pedestrian crossing, and an amber traffic light. Yee-haw! 
Klob's ears flapped in the wind. That's more like it! Heady stuff, eh? I eased the throttle off and grinned as the silencers snarled a delinquent crubba crubba crubba. It was, I agreed, heady stuff. I think I might be getting the hang of this. I had bought the bike a little under an hour ago from a small bike shop on the outskirts of the city. It says here, I'd read off a piece of handwritten card propped on the fuel tank, that it's the classic water-cooled triple. The shop owner, a bald guy with a distinctive trident beard and a leather waistcoat, looked askance, first at me, then at the ancient Kawasaki 750. Rockin' whole shit. Pardon? Uh, uh, rare. His grin revealed several gold crowns. Yeah, baby! Klob mounted the bike, making vroom, vroom noises. Even stationary, the bottle green bike looked menacing. It positively loomed. I couldn't imagine myself controlling anything so big. Come on, baby. Let me whip ya. The man said, One of the most powerful bikes on the road, the quacker. I wasn't really looking for anything fast. Oh, in its day, I meant. Now they're considered tame. Pussycat, really. Anyone can ride them. Really? Oh, yeah. Never ridden a quacker, I said, adopting the lingo. I was a Honda man. The step through Honda 90 had been passed down to me by my dad after he had a scare on it. On his way back from the model train shop, one of the tartan panniers came adrift on a roundabout and knocked a spring buff off a highly prized Fowler 4P coach. I'd never seen him so animated. I slapped the Kawasaki's seat, squeezed the brake lever, and kicked the tires. Um, it's very nice, isn't it? Solid like. The guy spread his hands. I can see you know your bikes. No wonder you were taking a good look at this beautiful machine. Come into my office, brother. I always relish the opportunity to chat with a fellow diehard. In his office, he introduced himself as Zack. But you can call me Big Zack. He gave me a can of warm beer and told me he had somebody else interested in the bike. But if you pay cash, I can let you ride it away today. You're not a time waster, I hope. Just then, Clob came dashing in, skidding on the greasy floor. Linny! Linny! That bike's got a bad oil leak! A girly calendar hung behind Big Zack's head. A nurse with infeasible breasts was doing something unorthodox with a stethoscope. I focused my attention on Zack with difficulty. I have the money, I said. That's not the hitch. Clob hopped from trotter to trotter. Too right, that's not the problem. I'm telling you, the bike's got a bloody great puddle of oil under it. Zack's heavy hand clapped my shoulder. There's no such thing as a problem, Leonard. Only solutions we have yet to find. He nodded slowly, savouring his home-brewed philosophy. So, what is the goddamn hitch? He growled. Lenny, listen to me. There is a better bike at the other end of the showroom. A 1,000cc monster. Imagine what Catherine will say to that. Grr, go get him, tiger. I said, I-, I don't have a helmet or jacket, Mr. Big Zack, or any other protective gear. My voice hardly quavered. He slammed a helmet and leather jacket on the desk. All inclusive. Can't say fairer than that, can I? Clob cast an eye over the helmet. This thing's knackered. It's a bleeding liability, this is. And that jacket stinks. Tell the big lummox to shove them where the sun don't shine. I mentioned to Mr. Big Zack that, with all respect, I thought the helmet and jacket had seen better days. The distressed look is in. <laughs> Chicks dig it. Clob went quiet. I thought of Catherine as a chick for the first time and said, So how much did you say for the bike? I stalled the bike six times before I got it out of the garage. I asked Zack what I was doing wrong, and he introduced me to the mysterious lever on the left handlebar. This, Big Zack told me with a smile lubricated by the flow of cash, was for operating the clutch. All bikes have them, discounting those poxy automatic Honda step throughs. Not that you'd call one of those things a bike, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes, <laughs> yes, poxy, they are. <laughs> How we both laughed. I'd decided to take a ride in the countryside before going to Catherine's house. 
figuring I needed a little time to get used to the characteristics of the bike, like addictive acceleration. Just over an hour had passed since leaving the shop, and buses trundling past me were a distant memory. I snicked the gear lever up into fourth and whacked the throttle open. The front wheel went light and the handlebars shimmied. My cheeks wobbled. My shoulders strained, building streaked by. Then I noticed a regular blue flash in the periphery of my vision. Lenny, it's the plod! Make a run for it! Ah, I groaned and pulled over. You stopped! Klopp said in an accusatory tone. The amount of smoke this thing's chucking out, he won't have been able to read your number plate. You should have cleared off. The double-decker came past to a chorus of laughter and rude gestures through the back window. Klopp turned and wobbled his bottom. There was a fut sound and a wisp of black smoke curled up behind him. Klob, I complained. Stop that. Huh. If I wasn't an imaginary pig, I'd go and sort the little bastards out. Shut up. Now watch and learn. I'd read in a book by Dr. Desmond Morris that you could get away with minor traffic offences by adopting certain body postures, that less than 10% of communication was verbal. These postures ape our distant ancestors' body postures for submission. Step one, Klob, is to get on the other man's turf so they feel stronger. So I am getting off my bike and walking slowly to the police car. Step two is to make your head lower than his. That is why I am sagging slightly at the knees. That's... fascinating. Thank you. Now, step three is to make an appeasement face. So I let my lips sag at the corners, like this, taking care not to reveal my teeth, and scrunch up my eyebrows. Afternoon, Sergeant, I said aloud, promoting the young constable a stripe or two. What seems to be the problem? The police officer's smile was pure predator. Been reading Dr. Morris, have we, sir? I returned to my motorcycle five minutes later, a chastened man, with my pockets thirty pounds lighter and my license three penalty points heavier. I noticed hot oil dribbling from the Kawasaki's engine casing. I didn't know anything about bikes, but I knew that it wouldn't be wise to start the bike again until the leak had been properly fixed. If the gearbox seized while I was in motion, it could throw me off. Let's take it back to what's-his-name, Klopp said. You mean Big Zack? We are closer to Catherine's house. If I can get it there, I can probably fix it myself. Or get somebody to come and have a look at it. Yeah, like that Zack fella. If he thinks he can rip off Leonard Strombolt Jr., he's got another think coming. Right, Lenny? Yeah, right. I said without enthusiasm. But first things first, I removed my helmet and jacket and hung them over the stricken bike. Why not get a toe off somebody? You're never going to push this thing the four or five miles to that frigid bird's house. Something snapped inside me. I brought my fist down on the tank. Don't you ever call her that again. Understand? Ever. A beautiful, sensitive woman wants to spend time with me without committing herself to then that's fine. There's nothing amiss in that. Nothing at all. My anger choked me. I snatched at the handlebars and let the side stand retract. It clattered against the silencer. It's all your fault that I'm in this sodding mess. Get a motorbike and impress her, you said. Well, it's going to really impress her when I turn up on a doorstep with this clapped out pile of jap crap. Practically penniless and with a conviction for speeding, isn't it? I leaned against the bike to get it rolling. Clob wailed. I was only thinking about you. Wrong. You were thinking about instant gratification. So? Klob. Yes? Get off the bike. But I don't weigh anything. I'm a figment of... Get off! After only minutes of pushing, damp patches had stained my t-shirt under the arms and across my back. My hair clung to my forehead and sweat dribbled into my eyes. Every slight incline took its toll on my legs. I chopped the journey into increments, mentally checking off landmarks as I passed them to make the journey seem smaller. Klob kept up a stream of complaints about his aching trotters, and I made him walk all the way. No less than five motorcyclists stopped to see if I needed assistance. I thanked them all, but refused their kind offers of lifts home. A man and his wife offered to come back with their bike trailer. I waved them away politely, my pride intact. I was a man on a mission. Klob declared me insane. Mad as a bleeding hatted. I was less than a mile from Catherine's home when I realized I'd conquered the last major steep bank. This called for a rest. I flipped the side stand down with my foot and let the bike lean onto it. 
Only in my exhausted state, I never registered the clatter as the stand accidentally retracted back into place under the silencer. Before I knew what was happening, the bike toppled over with me under it, both of us hitting the pavement hard. Petrol spilled over my jeans, a mirror shattered, and a rear indicator broke off to hang by a single red wire. I kicked the bike off me, scrambled to my feet, and stared at the Kawasaki in disgust, experiencing a silent roaring in my head. I was looking down through a blurred tunnel. A passing driver honked his amusement. You prat! I was too despondent to even throw him a rude gesture. Klob did it for me. Then the little pig turned round and spun a handle on his hip, unraveling the hose pipe that is his wanger. In a detached, unhurried fashion, I unfastened my trousers and joined in. I swiveled my hips for maximum effect, reveling in the hollow ringing sound the yellow jet made on the lacquered metal. Klob sighed and reeled himself in. Well, I don't know about you, sunshine, but I feel a lot better for that. My anger drained away with the last drop of urine. Reaction set in. Sweat on my body turned icy cold as if someone had thrown a bucket of water over me. I began to tremble, teeth chattering. I picked up the mercifully unsplashed leather jacket and, leaving the bike where it lay, walked to Catherine's house. I hung my head in shame all the way. A worried Catherine met me at the door. You said you'd be here hours ago. I phoned your mum and dad and they didn't know where you were. It's not like you, Leonard. Can I come in, please? She moved aside, and I traipsed into her living room. She stood in the doorway, watching me as though I was a stranger. Woman's intuition? She sensed something was amiss with me. I'll go and put the castle on. She disappeared into the kitchen. Claub, now minus the crash helmet, popped up on the back of the settee. You're not going to tell her the truth, are you? That would be a big, big mistake. She's a classy girl, Lenny. And too good for me, Clob. Don't talk stupid. I am stupid. Don't you realize what I've done? I deliberately set out to get the loveliest girl in the world to sleep with me. I even pushed the bike instead of getting a lift because I thought I still had a chance to salvage some pride. Or, to put it another way, a chance to impress her. All that guff about friendship and mutual respect... It was just so much hot air. Don't beat yourself up over it, Lenny. 99% of guys would do the same. It's only natural. Probably something to do with testosterone. But Catherine is one in a million, Clob. Don't you see? She deserves better than a 99%er. So I'm going to tell her the truth and then walk out of that door. I stopped subvocalizing when I noticed Catherine observing me from the lounge doorway. Always a million miles away, Leonard. What are you thinking? She moved to within a foot of me and touched my brow. I committed the touch to memory, so that, like a happy childhood experience, I could bring it out to brighten my skies on a rainy day. She said, I bet it's something really deep. Catherine, I... Claude made frantic neck-chopping motions. Catherine, I bought a motorbike today. A motorbike? You? Uh Uh-huh. She plucked at the jacket. I wondered why you were wearing that oily old thing. Yeah, but the damn thing broke down and I had to push it the last four miles. When she didn't believe me, I showed her the blisters on my palms. Oh, Leonard, you poor man. Poor man, my arse! You want to see my trotters? Claude was jumping up and down, snorting and spitting like a slightly damp firecracker. I ignored him and told Catherine the bike's ultimate fate. You urinated on it? Her hands shot to her face. In broad daylight, you urinated on it. I nodded miserably. Oh my god, did anyone see you? There was a lot of traffic, so yes, I guess so. But this is a close-knit community, Leonard. People around here know who you are. They know you're my boyfriend. Two spots of colour had appeared on her cheekbones. I'll go now. I'd better arrange for someone to retrieve the bike. I can't believe that anyone I know would do such a thing. She said in a small voice. Sorry. It's just so animalistic. Yes. It was pretty animalistic, I suppose. Couldn't you control yourself? Seems not. I guess I just lost it. Animalistic. She put her arms around my waist and pulled the t-shirt from out of my jeans. Really, really filthy. You just got your thing out there and then. 
in broad daylight, urinated on a motorbike. Catherine? Leave the jacket on. Hmm. Oh, God. Don't you just love the smell of leather and oil and petrol and honest toil? It's just so... Animalistic. Yes. Oh, get a room! Plob guffawed and disappeared <laughs> like a burst soap bubble. My eyes swiveled to the settee and then back to Catherine's face before sliding down to where she had pushed her warm, questing hands. Sometimes I hate Clob. I like to think our intellect can score over our base desires. That careful, considered deliberation is better than gut instinct. Sometimes I hate Clob. But not always. Author's note. My name is Heather Stone, and it was my dad that wrote the story you just listened to. So, Dad, what's with the boot bags in a lot of your stories? I don't know, just had a lifelong fascination with them. Lifelong? Yeah, lifelong. The fascination didn't have to kick until I was 17, and I'm 43 now, but lifelong sounds better than 26 years. I'll stick with that, eh? What was the first bag you had? First buy, a little purple Yamaha FS1E. Only had it four days though and I smashed it up. Didn't put me off though, well, not much. Before long, you're going on Grandad's garage, was absolutely filled with bikes. I had bikes we had to work on, trail bikes we going off the road, and Sunday best bikes, oh, Sunday best. Where did you get the idea from for this story? It's partly autobiographical. I once had to push a broken down 750, which is a fat, big heavy buggy, for three miles in steaming hot weather while wearing a full leather suit. I didn't take revenge on the bike in the manner of Lenny in Japanese motorcycle, but only because I'd sweated out all my body with boots. What do you mean? Never you mind, I'll tell you when you're older. Can I listen to the story now? Maybe when you're older. How much older? How old are you now? Eight. I'll give it another 20 years or so then. This interview is so over. All right, welcome back, everybody. Thanks for listening to the story. I love Mike Stone stories. I don't know about you, but I pick the stories, so that's why you see them a lot. I pick my nose. Yeah, that's about the extent of it. But this is the third Michael Stone story we've done on the site. Is that a record? Yeah, I think it is a record. I think you're right. Good for you, Michael. So, And this is the first sequel we've done on the show. Yeah, I like to see uh, stories coming back again. We do have another sequel coming down the pipes, so get ready. Uh, I don't know. I how thought you, you were do talking that, to them. I, I will get ready. Yes. Yes. Get ready. Go Almost. Change your clothes because that's not going to do. <laughs> <laughs> Once again, we treated our listeners to our fine English accents. <laughs> something I'm sure they look forward to. They're just hoping that there will be an episode with accents week to week. And we can't always please them, but this week we were able to. Pleasantly please them. (laughs) And Emma Dewberry returns again, reprising her role as Catherine Hewson. And we'd like to thank her for uh, helping us out on that. It's so weird that we're doing a sequel and we had to scramble and try and get people to do the same voices and try and remember who did Claude and who did (laughs) She's not interested. She's not interested. That will always be the prototypical Claude line in my mind. (laughs) I don't know why. Either you did a very good job or... I did a good job. Yeah, right. I really enjoy, again, being able to do my goofy Scottish accent. It was Scottish. But yeah, that was fun. So, are there other club stories? I don't think so. Maybe we can encourage Michael now to give it another shot. That's right. Mid-November, Mickey Mouse Club coming up. <laughs> Babysitter's Club. There's a lot of uh, unused clubs out there that you could tap into. If you get my drift. Oh, jeez. I'm happy to retire that voice for another fortnight. 
What is a fortnight? I think that's uh, two weeks. So you might want to retire it for longer than that. Six months. How's that? Okay. Hey, I, I, I just wanted to mention that at the local bookstore, I saw an anthology, a horror anthology that had a Michael Stone story in it. Really? That's cool. What was it called? It was called Joy Luck Cloth. <laughs> no, no. It, uh, if I recall, it was called The Undead Flesh Feast. Uh, no, really. What was it called, man? The Undead Flesh Feast. Oh, okay. But uh, that's cool that I could find that in a local bookstore. Yeah, that is great. I think that's really awesome. Our friend, this is me making quotes in the air, Michael Stone had written a story in there. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that is cool. It's like grab the guy standing next. Hey, I know this guy. And he was like, oh, me, freak. Yeah, and why are you naked? <laughs> was it a paperback or a uh, hardback, do you know? It was what they call in the comic book biz a trade paperback. Oh, trade Which is an paperback. oversized right. paper. It's a big one. Club back in the box <laughs> for another six months. What have I told you? Oh, that should probably be Leonard, huh? Wait, how does Leonard talk? He talks like, oh, I am Leonard. Leonard Strombolt. <laughs> oh, no. Am I that bad? All right, so uh, yeah, that's that's. Uh, it was a great story, and again, you know, we love Michael Stone stories, so we'd like to have more. Although he's starting to become a real author, it seems he's going to forget that he ever knew us. But I guess you know it's going to happen eventually with all of them. I mean, who would want to remember that they ever knew us, really? But uh, it'll be cool to uh, <laughs> keep talking. <laughs> It'll be cool to uh, look back when we've got the great Michael Stone uh, catalog on our bookshelf. It'll be cool to look back and think, you know, we had Michael Stone stories back in the day. Speaking of the day, I think this is our last issue of the first year. Wow. Isn't that weird? That is. It's crazy. We've been doing these things for a damn year. And I don't know what Steve means. It's a, <laughs> we say it again and again. What? What is this word, Steve? You know, <laughs> it's a funny story. One time when I was, you know, a teenager, you always got to try everything out when you're a teenager. Oh, so this is one of those stories. <laughs> oh, candid photography. Hi, hi, no to me, no to me. No, I'm sorry, we don't have a camera. All right, so me and my friends were messing around, and so we got ourselves a Ouija board. We went to my cousin Chad's house and we set it up on the table and we got like candles out and all this stuff and we lit it and we were all like excited. <laughs> we're going to do this. This is going to be so neat. We're going to do spirits and it's going to be evil. <laughs> we got it and, you know, we were messing around and at first everybody's like pushing on the thing and pretending to, to make it uh, move. And then all of a sudden it started moving on its own. We we're still touching it and everybody accused the other person of moving it, but it was moving on its own. And it first went to the letter D, and then to U and N, and it kept going until it spelled the word Dune Steve. And we were like, what? What is Dune Steve? And so Chad, he was like the one that was in charge, and he's asked, he says, Spirit, what is this Dune Steve? What, is, what does Dune Steve mean? What is it? Is it someone? Who is it? What is Dune Steve? And it was like the room was growing. We could feel like a presence in there. And maybe, maybe the room wasn't. Maybe we were getting smaller. I don't know what it was. All the hairs on my arms started tingling and, and standing up on end. And we were all freaking out. And we were looking around at each other. And it felt like, you know, there was some kind of a presence there. And then the marker started moving again. And then Chad's mom came in and turned on the light. And she said, what are you guys doing? Are you playing doctor with your cousins again? And she took the Ouija board and ripped it in half and threw it in the garbage and sent Chad to military school. And I haven't ever seen him again. And so that's what Doon Steve is. No, 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 wait, wait, that, that doesn't explain anything. Didn't you ask anybody about the word or, or at least do a, a Google search or something on it? No, I never thought of doing that. Oh, jeez. I'm sorry, folks. Uh, Aroid OT, would you edit out the conversation? <clears throat> no, no, it's a great story. Never mind. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, folks. So if you know what Dune Steve means or will you would at least like to see the Dune Steve keep going, We'd love for you to help us out. Uh, there are several ways you can do that. One of the most important ways is offering us a small donation, or a large one for that matter. On the website, there's a little button you can go to, and you can press the button. I press the button. And donate to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And there is a special gift for everyone who donates a 
story written by none other than Rish Outfield will be a special parting gift for anyone who donates. Parting gift, that's great. (laughs) This really is the last episode. (laughs) If you donate twice, then you get a story by Big Anklevich. Okay, so folks, just donate a great deal the first time. Yeah, so that you don't have to do it twice. So, according to the calendar... The big day has come and gone, the release of Pixar's newest film, Up. Yeah, I was really looking forward to this film, but then I look forward to any Pixar release. Some people might call me an apologist. Oh, why? What what do they have to apologize? See, I don't think they have anything to apologize for, but it seems like anybody who shows up in defense of something that is being maligned is automatically labeled an apologist. Why? I wasn't aware that Americans were intelligent enough to bandy about a term like apologist. That's awesome. (laughs) You've just raised my estimation of an entire culture. It's just one of those words that people use a lot on, like, internet message boards. That and vitriol, they always say that word, too, as though they know what it means. What I was going to say was, it seems like whoever is on top, whoever is king of the hill right now, is the one that seems to be the most maligned. If there's a movie that everybody else loves, oh, if yeah. you want to be a person with a safety pin in your cheek, you tell people how overrated that movie is. And what sucks is, I've done that many times myself. <laughs> My, I love They Might Be Giants. They're the best band. Yeah, they're the best overrated band today. And, and I love They Might Be Giants. It's just one of those things that I don't know why I do it. You've done it. When everybody elevates something... It's kind of like when you log on to Amazon.com and you see that the four Twilight books are sitting atop their bestseller list there, and then suddenly you just have to hate Twilight. Well, see, having tried to read those effing books, <laughs> I have a legitimate reason to hate Twilight. But but I see what you're saying. You and I, well, I coined a term <laughs> that we still use called Shrek Syndrome. And it's just when something that's all right is considered so great that other people start to hate it. People start talking about Napoleon Dynamite. You know, that was, that was a pretty good movie. No, that was the best movie ever, man, <laughs> ever. Then suddenly I start to hate Napoleon Dynamite or fill in the blank, anything like that, where it gets these almost religiously zealous devotees to it. And stop it. Stop it, you zealots. And yeah, it, it, it instantly puts me off from something. And I, I suppose there are things that I'm really passionate about, too, that other people might... Like Star Trek or Star Wars or... But, well, I think that sort of happened. It's been about a month since uh, Abrams' Star Trek came out. And a lot of people held that up as, wow, this is awesome. This is a great movie. And as soon as that happened, there were people that were like, you know what? That movie sucked. That movie was as bad as Final Frontier huh. and, and everything. I'm sure the people don't actually feel that way. <laughs> I don't feel that Shrek is a terrible terrible movie it's Uh not but i but you're angry at it for being so well loved when it doesn't quite deserve it since we're talking about pixar eventually you need it stole the oscar from monsters incorporated and stole a lot of the is it limelight is that the word i'm looking for sure and it elevated a mediocre animation studio to the a-list yeah dreamworks was nothing and dreamworks continues to put out mediocre entertainment that people scoop up Like it's manna from heaven, and then they have to go proselytize. Taste this! Taste this! It's delicious! It's manna from heaven! It's it's zero-calorie manna! Those DreamWorks films, they're slapsticky kids' films with celebrity voices and multi-million dollar ad campaigns. And uh, you know what? If you love them, that's cool. Maybe I should start to love them too. Maybe I should hate them a little bit better. Open your heart a little. Let some light in there. Wait, wait. You <laughs> presume to judge me, sir. Because I was going crap, to say, man. there's only one person I've ever met who feels more strongly about such things. <laughs> and luckily, we have him in the studio today. Announcer man, would you introduce our special guest? Zing! <laughs> yeah, I don't know how it is that I became such a Pixar fan. Well, anybody who's seen Toy Story. Uh, I, guess, I don't know. I, but yeah, I know people who have seen... Toy Story and Bugs Life and Toy Story 2 and Monsters Incorporated and Shrek. 
and Over the Hedge and Ice Age and thought they all came from the same studio. It doesn't make them fans of Pixar. It just makes them fans of computer animated films or something. I don't know. But yeah, I was thinking back on this because uh, leading up to Up, that's kind of an awkward sentence, but anyways. So, I, right, we're not professional podcasters. <laughs> I talked my children into watching all, because we own all the Pixar movies on DVD. And so should you. And we, I talked my children into making movie night out of watching Pixar movies for the whole month of May. And we steadily worked our way from Toy Story 1 all the way through to Wally. e And uh, seeing all the older ones, it makes me kind of look back on, on what was going on when they first came out and stuff like that. And it seems to me that I was always a huge fan of Pixar. I don't remember not knowing what was Pixar and what wasn't. I mean, when Ants came out, yeah, there was no confusion. I already knew, oh, that's the, the crappy one that they rushed out to take advantage of the uh, buzz that comes from the other studio that made something worthwhile and was really good, uh, you know. And so I, I never was confused. I didn't automatically hate everything that came from elsewhere, although that eventually made its way into my uh, thought process. And now it takes a lot for someone to convince me to watch a non-Pixar animated film. I generally think, eh, that sounds all right, but, you know, maybe my kids will watch it, but I won't bother. Well, we talked a little bit about our love for Pixar when we did our WALL-E episode. Right. And crazily, that was a year ago. Close, but. yeah. Time to shut down the podcast, folks. We've been going for far too long. I guess I'd agree <laughs> with you on that. I've been a Pixar fan since the day Toy Story came out. Uh, it just, it looked... Magical, and it, it did have a lot of buzz behind it. Buzz Lightyear. Indeed. <laughs> and it came at the tail end of the Silver Age of Disney animation. And by that point, some of Disney's feature animation had suffered by oversaturation. Uh -huh. you know, Putting we, out if, two films a year, etc. And they started to depend on what celebrity voices there might be that worked on it. And uh, a lot of Toy Story was pitched based on Tom Hanks and Tim Allen's voice. But that was the last time they ever had to do that. It's amazing. They Tom never... Hanks is great, though. That, that's one person you can never complain about having do a voice. I don't know. It's like he can't do any wrong. Even when he does a movie that's not great, you still go, well, it's Tom Hanks was in it, so made it that much better. In my childhood, my dad would have a couple of actors, and he would say, fill in the blank. John Steven Wayne. Seagal can't make a bad movie. <laughs> he didn't say that. Come on. <laughs> Dolph Lundgren isn't capable <laughs> of making a terrible movie. He just, there were certain actors who had a cachet, uh, and they had a, a quality, and they had enough clout to get the really good scripts back in the studio system or, or after the studio system fell apart. Or people like Jimmy Stewart that could take a, a movie that maybe wasn't great and just by being in it, it elevated the material. We don't have a lot of those today. There are mm -hmm. great actors like John Cusack or Robert Downey Jr. that can be in a movie and it can still be a really bad movie. But Tom Hanks seems to be one of those that elevates the material. And maybe it's just he gets the best scripts. Yeah, it could be. But I don't know. There, there are sometimes movies that aren't so good. But if Tom Hanks is in it, it's still worth seeing. Tom Hanks is definitely one of those that you, you can't miss with, which is it's cool that they managed to get him as Woody. And he comes back and back. I mean, he freaking came back to do the credits for Cars, where he just said, you are a toy car. Yeah, that's one I don't really know how they did that. I mean, hopefully, <laughs> John Lasseter just sent everybody an email and said, here's our voicemail, and here's the lines you're supposed to, to read. And they did that. I, I can't imagine it. they had everybody march into the studio. Oh, but, I'm sure they had to. But, wow. They, they probably had to, you know, drive on down to L.A. and go to some recording studio and bring everybody in for their one little bit. And they were all there. I mean, it was John Goodman and uh, Billy Crystal, and it was... Dave I, Foley? Is it Dave Foley? I don't know. I don't remember Dave his name. Foley's I just name. remember what he looks like. Well, it, his name wasn't all over the ad oh. campaign because <laughs> it, it was the content yeah. that they had. To sell the show. They didn't... I, oh, boy, don't you love it when you'll see somebody's name in one of these competitors' trailers and it's like, featuring the voice of 
Hume Cronin, <laughs> David <laughs> Paymer, wouldn't know in a Judd. And you're just like, wait, wait, I don't understand. Why Why you guys? <laughs> Eric McCormick. And I'm like, wait, stop saying names. <laughs> you don't mean anything. Gary, Gary Coleman. Coleman. And I'm like, wait, sir, please. So, to me, that always seems like a crutch. No, it doesn't seem. That is a yeah. crutch, ladies and gentlemen. If the voice that fits the character is a big name like Tom Hanks, that's fine. But trying to sell the movie on that person's name. I mean, you don't even see them on film. You just hear their voice. You know, it's it's just ridiculous and it shouldn't be done. Well, I'm surprised like, that Pixar didn't go that route with Up, though, because, you know, Ed Asner, she's got such a marketable name. That's right. That's going to put some <laughs> Asners in the seat. My that's friend. right. And I always wondered why Craig T. Nelson's name wasn't above the title <laughs> in Incredibles. Surprising. But we may have talked about this last year. One of the reasons that Pixar reigns supreme is that story comes first, man. Mm-hmm. And that's something that we talked about off While the we were air. hanging out. You'll see some of those deleted scenes. And, and the one that most readily comes to mind is the alternate ending to Wally, where Eve is the one that's damaged and Wally comes to the rescue and he helps her. I watched that. And it was just, I mean, my goodness, that was awesome to use your language (laughs) or rad in my case. Yeah. And on the commentary, he talks about it and he's like, yeah, oh, it was really good. But we were in the story meeting and we talked about it and we thought it could be even better if Wally were the one that was damaged and all of the other characters that he had influenced rallied together to help him. And Wally would have been a great movie with that ending in place. But the fact that they were willing to scrap all that work and just say, we can make it better, is why Wally will still be talked about 50 years from now when robots are actually watching it. (laughs) (laughs) I have so much more head articulation than Wally does. But uh, that's something that you were talking about. Oh, no, no. It was an interview about Up where they talked about a scene that they cut out of Up that was just like a, a, a little joke while the bad guy was talking at the dinner. They were going to show something that had happened. It was a cutaway and that they – I didn't. I almost said that they shot it. But they had animated it and all that and it was funny. But then when they were editing things together, they thought, well, it is funny. It's a laugh. But it undercuts the menace of this scene and how much of a bad guy this guy seems to be if we cut away and show that, you know, he had made a mistake with the dog collars and whatever it might be. And then they said, yeah, we were sorry to see it go, but it had to go to strengthen the palpable tension of that scene where you're like, oh, no, you guys got to get out of here. And that is something I think that we talked about. It's like any other animation studio would have built their whole film around that deleted moment of levity. And that would have been the mainstay of their trailer or their TV spot ad campaign is like, oh, 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 there's a dog that announces every time he goes to the bathroom. And they would expect that that's what's going to get people to go see their movie. That and the celebrity voice of Haley Haley Duff. 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 So I'm sorry, we were going to talk about Up. We are going to talk about Up. Yeah, we built the whole month of May around the uh, upcoming release. I watched all the nine Pixar films that preceded Up and uh, promised my kids that I would take them all to go and see the 10th Pixar release. A cool thing happened. I happened to get several free passes to go and see Up. So uh, we even got to see that for free. I had enough to bring Rish and his niece along. And we all went to the film and we all piled in. And it was it was a fun experience because it was a preview. They had all sorts of crap going on, like free t-shirts. That they're like, okay, before we start, here's free stuff. And they just had people hucking who's, free shirts Who's out. cute? Let's see. Uh, here's a shirt for you, man. I, I wish Put it, it on. I wish it worked out that way. Unfortunately, the guy who was throwing out the free stuff was standing about two aisles in front of us. And everything he threw was traveling just above what I could reach and going way too fast. He never tossed anything down close enough, although my daughter didn't manage to lasso a hat. The trivia contest was really cool. Um, unfortunately, there were no no prizes for the trivia contest because it was conducted by Rish. He just continued grilling my kids for the 20 or 30 minutes that we had to sit in the theater waiting for the film to start. Who is the arch enemy of Buzz Lightyear? <laughs> but how well did my kids do on that quiz, huh? They knew their stuff. That was really impressive. And all three were answering. Yeah, even the five-year-old was nailing all these questions. Maybe it had something to do with us watching all nine films the month before uh, Up came out. They had it all fresh in their memory, but yeah, they were pretty uh, on top of it. So the film started, 
And we didn't get any trailers, but we did get the Pixar short, which, uh, you know, that's a tradition that I absolutely love. And I know that John Lasseter is supposed to be restarting that tradition with the one D, with the 2D animation. What is 1D? Is there such a thing? Just a line? Again, and I guess they already did one goofy cartoon that they did before National Treasure 2. You are correct, sir. Unfortunately, I never saw that. You movie. are fortunate, sir. Anyways, I just love the whole idea of showing the short before the film. You know, I really love that old 40s, 30s tradition where they used to go to the movies and they spent the whole night there and they had the newsreel and they had the main feature and they had the B movie and they had the cartoon and they had all those things to see and that tradition kind of steadily fizzled out as TV came along. But there's no reason not to have a short cartoon at the start and Pixar's been doing that from the beginning. Yeah. But yeah, so... The cartoon that they showed at the start of Up, I'm willing to say that that's their best short cartoon they've done yet. It's called Partly Cloudy, and dude, it was just great. It was really funny, and it was really well done. I was bawling. <laughs> I am not ashamed to say I was a wreck. Yeah, it was just really good. You know, before that, I would say my favorite Pixar short so far would be Jerry's Game. Which was uh, from way back in Bugs Life. That's the one that. where the uh, husband handcuffs the girl to the bed and then he dies of a heart attack. You're mocking me, aren't you? No, 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 no. A big looking alien. <laughs> it starts off showing you storks and the storks come in and, you know, and they're delivering the babies to everybody who needs a baby. And all the babies are so cute and cuddly. And, and it, it was not just human babies, but yeah, puppies. It was and puppies and kittens. They were get, delivering all the cute babies, you know, and then they, they fly back up and there's these cute little puffy clouds that are creating these babies and giving them to the storks to go down. All the storks just love their job. They get to give people these cute little babies and, and then it pans down and there's a dark cloud that makes... The non-cute babies, it makes the, like, the the first baby I think it makes is the alligator baby. And uh, then there's the poor stork that has to deliver these babies. And it's just so funny to see these babies maltreat this poor stork. And the stork just never, you know, seems to hate his job like he should. Even though, you know, he flies up, he goes to grab the uh, alligator baby. And the alligator baby bites his entire head. And, uh, you know, you see the stork dark breathing from inside the baby <laughs> it's just so hilarious and 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 it even has a little bit of a, a, a message you know well yeah that's what got me of it is just how sweet that ended up being in the ending and oh i was bawling <clears throat> <laughs> yeah to tell you how much of a geek i am and if you've ever listened to the show, you know. Since we saw it early, I went onto the Wikipedia page and I was the one that typed the synopsis. Oh, for wow. How about that? No! Sorry, please, please edit that out, our way to <laughs> Nice. Yeah we, yeah, we did get to see that, what, three days early? Yeah. Somebody that I came across, and they're like, yeah, are you going to see Up this weekend? And I was just like, <laughs> Silly loser. I've already seen it. <laughs> Silly loser. <laughs> and then it moved on to the actual film. And we and saw it in 2D, not 3D. Yeah, we did. I thought it was going to be 3D, but it turned out to not be. So I've yet to see a 3D film in theaters since that whole thing has started coming out. I, I didn't get out to see the Hannah Montana concert. That's all oh, right. Hopefully they'll make a sequel. They were clever enough to show us the 2D version and remind us that there is a 3D <laughs> version out there if we were willing to pay for it. Yeah. And I'd guess that half of those people will. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised. After I saw the film, I went to see, you know, what everybody had to say in their reviews. Isn't that always a mistake? Not necessarily. I couldn't find a negative review. There were some that said, oh, this part or that part wasn't so great, but not a single one of them was like, eh, you should skip this film. I wonder what my cousin would have said about this movie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure your cousin would have said that it's sex. But yeah, every single review said the same thing, which was the first... 
10 minutes, whatever it is, of this film are just absolutely sublime. They're just fantastic. It's just amazing how good. And it's basically like the backstory, the intro to this film. It's the whole life of that character. Yeah. It of was Carl, just, right? You know, if they'd turned up the lights after that montage was over and said, okay, uh, that was our show, I would have been like, wow, you know, that was really good. It was kind of short, but you know, it was really good. That one just flew by, honey. <laughs> and I've heard a lot of people talk about Wally in the same vein. They say, you know, the first half hour or however long it was of it was just so daring, so amazing, and so good. And then after Wally leaves Earth, you know, it becomes kind of your, your standard movie. It's too bad that it... And I, I can't see how they could have carried that first half hour on through the whole film unless they could figure out something. I don't know. Well, it, I, I hate to get off on a tangent, but I do it every week. There was that movie in 99 that Disney did, apart from Pixar, called Dinosaur. <laughs> where it was basically Tarzan told with CG dinosaurs. And if you recall the first trailer for that... Was like the first five minutes well, of the Well, film we didn't know that. We didn't know that that's the opening of the film. But the, yeah, the trailer was just no dialogue, just the life and interaction of these dinosaurs. And I remember saying, oh my gosh, I am there first day. That looks <laughs> awesome. That looks like something I've never seen before. And a movie that just lets itself tell the story. You know, they, they did those Walking with Dinosaurs movies was it for A&E or History Channel or what was it? Nature, uh, Animal TLC. Planet. TLC. That used to stand for the Learning Channel, but I don't think they can call themselves that anymore since all they show is like what not to wear and home improvement shows. Ew. But I remember being so excited for that. And yes, that's the opening three minutes of Dinosaur and then the love monkey comes in and, and it becomes, oh, again, the retelling of Tarzan, which I could be wrong, but I think that was the same year that Disney 2D animation did Tarzan. Yeah, the, the Silver Age was done. <laughs> but I could see afterward, in hindsight, well, it would have been just too courageous, too daring, too outrageous for them to think that you could do a 70-minute movie about the life cycle and interactions of, of, of dinosaurs and the fear of the giant one and, right. and all that. Well, considering they spent like $200 million on that film, I can understand. I mean, all the backgrounds and stuff was real video. I mean, they went out and they... They shot plates, yeah. They, yeah, they freaking shook the trees around for when the dinosaurs ran through it and that kind of stuff. Of course, it, it didn't help. The film still was a spectacular failure. But visually, it was amazing. It looked great. But there was not a story, a bedrock upon which right. to build which this great film. I think that Pixar would dare to do a film like that. Now, granted, you don't want to do Dinosaur because now that's been done to death by the documentarians and stuff. But boy, they made a lot of money off of those. I remember they would have a new one every six months with CG, life cycle of a whatever it is. They, they even got beyond dinosaurs and it started to be like prehistoric mammals and such. Uh -huh. It was the life cycle of a Cambodian woman later. And I was like, wow, why did she have to be CG? I'm, I'm not really sure, but it, it's totally compelling. Back on topic, guys. So back but, to Up, you know, we saw the whole life of Carl. I mean, it starts out with him as like an eight-year-old or something like that. And then, and this is something, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a sucker for the stories where kids fall in love. They're friends from the time that they're really young and then they grow up and they get married and they, you know, live happily ever after. That kind of a thing, you know, I, I really ate that up. And it was, you know, there wasn't a lick of dialogue from the time that they started into the montage to the time that it ended. It was all just told with pictures, uh, which is not something you see very often. Well, I think there's usually a, a lack of trust. What if the kids get bored? What if somebody doesn't understand that she can't have children? What, what, what if? But it's just, it's so amazing to have somebody have enough faith in the audience. And, and that was another thing that was so courageous about this film was that it's about a 78-year-old <laughs> man and... They don't make any bones about that. Sure, the dog and the balloons and all that stuff is in the ad campaign. But it is the story of Carl, an elderly man. And yet every single kid in the, that theater was totally glued yeah. to the screen. And he's not a hip elderly man either. I mean, sometimes they, you know, make the, the grandma or whoever, somebody that's totally down with the kids or whatever. And this guy definitely wasn't that. I Jet ski and grandma shite from Hoodwink. We will talk of Hoodwink someday. No! Uh, yeah. 
there were points, I think, somewhere towards the middle where the, the movie seemed to lag a little bit. Maybe it was because they were introducing the dog, introducing the bad guy, introducing... I think it was mostly just as they walked along, dragging the house behind them, trying to get to the top of the waterfall to put the house there and i guess that was kind of the point is that the kids just like oh, this is lame they just had to show just how one track mind carl had become that this was his goal and he had to accomplish that goal and then you know he had to learn you know sometimes what you think is your goal is not really where you should be headed you know the the movie was funny it wasn't a joke a minute kind of a thing they had some really great jokes in there. The one that just truly inspired was the, the alpha dog say. and his collar being broken. And just how, you know, it was just too funny for words to hear that dog try and be threatening with that goofy, high-pitched voice. Boy, that was a good movie, dude. Another thing that I found, I don't want to say daring, but I, I liked that the boy, Russell, was, was Asian. Uh-huh. But they never attention to it and they right. never had him say we are from mainland china and or any of that confucius said i mean it was just he was a kid uh-huh. and he happened to be asian but it didn't matter it didn't have anything to do with the story i don't know if that made them particularly brave that he happened to be asian but i think the fact that they never acknowledge it was brave yeah that was cool and, and they shouldn't they, have they, to they made him asian but they weren't pandering to Asians. He just was Asian. We could just go on and on about things that we loved, but the animation is beautiful, and the score was great, and the dialogue was clever and all that, but the heart of the film is what's going to make me buy it and want to watch it again and again and share it with somebody that, oh, you've not seen Up? Can Hey, let's watch it. And you mentioned the dog. When Doug comes to the door and we hear his thoughts... <laughs> um, after Carl has been angry with him. It's just so sweet. Do you remember what he said? He said something like, I was hiding under your porch because you were mad at me. Or, like, but, but I, I stayed am... there because you are my master. Yeah, I think it's like, because I am your dog and I love you or something like that. Dude, I cried there. I cried a lot through the film. And just, I, I, I mentioned Shrek syndrome before. I, I understand there probably are people that have a certain amount of Shrek syndrome toward Pixar and are hoping that they fail or that they put out a really bad movie. And it'll happen one of these yeah, days. Yeah, yeah, Nobody will. is perfect. You know, they say Babe Ruth struck out more times than anyone else in professional baseball. I think somebody's beaten him out since those days, but yeah. You know, I mean, because he... Somebody he, beat out his home run record, too, so no surprise. You're not helping. But it's just humanity. You, you can't be perfect. The Spanish have a saying, Aun Spielberg hizo hook. <laughs> I believe that was etched onto the walls of Machu Picchu. And philosophers have been pondering it for, for centuries, really. Yeah. Everybody is going to fail eventually or put out something that's not so good. And I hope that that time is far, far off. At the very least, I hope that the time where they start putting out a majority of stuff that is crap is far off. I, I, you know, there are some that I like less than others. There are some that, that just don't do it for me. And yet there are still parts in those that I think are really uh, well done. It's hard to say with Up because, yes, I've only seen it the one time. So who's to say exactly where it falls? But I would say Wally is probably second or third on my list. And Up is the one right behind that. And those came up after Ratatouille, which probably hits nine or ten for me. So as long as they can keep up a ratio like that where, you know, we get two to the top of the list every time we get one to the bottom of the list, you know, I'd be happy with that. That's cool. And you know what? There were a lot of people who really responded to Ratatouille. Yeah. I wasn't one of them either, but I know people that was like, this is Pixar's most beautiful film or yeah, most visually was, astounding or most complex or most adult or, or just It was whatever. very highly rated. And there are some great emotional moments in that. And that's one of the things that I love about Pixar is they always get your heartstrings, no matter what it is, whether it's a rat trying to make a meal for a mean critic or a race car that wants to win that big race and and has to learn the uh, lesson about what is more important or whatever it is to get the heartstrings and pluck at them. And, uh, you, you, you did say pluck, all right? Yeah. In rewatching them, did, do you find that any of the Pixar films have become dated? You know, I don't think so. 
with Toy Story, from the way the houses looked and some of the decorations, etc., that you had in Sid's house and in Andy's house, it seemed like the movie was set in the 70s, but there was cell phones and they were listening to Hakuna Matata in the car. It's just a nondescript nostalgic type era, but yet That's it still includes everything from the present. That's probably by design, isn't it? If it is, it's very smart. Can't really put a finger on when exactly it's set. And and that's because they're shooting for the long haul on this, aren't they? Probably. Like Babe Ruth, they've pointed to the the cheap seats. That's another thing is I don't think any of their jokes have been really a dated type joke either. It's not like, I want to say Aladdin or something, which has a lot of pop culture reference jokes in it. I didn't notice anything like that uh, as we went through. Maybe 10 years from now, we'll think that way about some of the newer ones, but I don't think so. Well, maybe cars will become more dated because those cars are going to look old someday. True, and there's a lot of cameos that they do have in cars as well, like Mario Andretti and Dale Earnhardt Jr. and, and Michael Schumacher and whatever. There's cars of all those guys time will tell if those become dated and i think that that's something that they have to keep in the back of their mind just from knowing that in walt's day he would re-release these movies every seven years or so and he would try and keep them in a faraway storybook land so that if perchance when these movies were still being seen 50 years in the future that our generation of children wouldn't think oh my gosh this is so old this is when grandma and grandpa were around So that was your first question. What was your other? Before we started recording, uh, we were talking, well, I I was talking, you just laid there, about what I coined the silver age of Disney animation, referencing the, the golden age of comic books and the silver age of comic books, where the golden age was way back when Superman and Batman were created. And the silver age was in the 60s when suddenly there was a resurgence in Spider Man, the Fantastic Four, and, and Angmar the Screamer, and all these characters were, were created that took the world by storm. And uh, I was sort of equating the, the whole 90s explosion of Disney feature animation as the Silver Age, when suddenly it came back again, just like it had back in the days when Walt was running the show. And we were talking about what killed that, what destroyed the Silver Age of Disney animation. And uh, I guess there were probably various factors, but the greatest has to have been greed. Yeah. And if anybody disagrees, then they're naive, because greed encompasses so much. And the easiest thing to point at is instead of it being an event where every three or four years or when we were kids, six or seven or eight years, a new Disney animated feature comes out. They thought, OK, well, let's do it every single year. Wow, those are successful. We'll do it twice a year. And yeah, when they hit twice a year, it was seriously downhill already. And you can see where I'm going here. We are in the era of the Pixar movie being, I don't want to say less special, but less out of the ordinary <laughs> Than it once was, where you were saying you had to wait three years between Toy Story and And Bugs Bugs Life. Life. That is kind of unfair because that was when they first started. I mean, Toy Story was the first feature-length computer animated film. So I'm sure there would be a little bit of a lag time before they get to the second one, etc. But it was originally something like every two years, and it's been up to every year and a half and it's gotten to the point where it's every year and in the future it's planned to be more than one a year yeah they have announced their upcoming slate into 2012 and they all have release dates they all have artwork that's been released for them it's a cool way to get people excited and it's like oh the bear and the bow i can't wait to see that but yeah eventually they are going to yeah, get to the dreamworks stage where they have several releases a year just been glutting the market and just rolling in the money that people are willing to throw at it and you know what that may not be fair some of these really crappy CG movies that come out in the theaters may not actually be DreamWorks. They may be Fox or they may be some yeah. other company. But we would never know because they look so much like the really inferior DreamWorks product. But I, I, I guess I was just seeing how the 2D animation failed and I'm just hoping that it doesn't happen with Pixar. And they've got a very strong group of animators of creators of writers of producers whatever you want to call it they sort of trade off and each one gets to do one each yeah. year and, and they that. keep developing them and bringing them forward and you know back in toy story days john lassiter was the guy in charge of everything he directed all the films and 
eventually Pete Doctor and Andrew Stanton were allowed to be the chief director. They weren't just the co-director or whatever. And Bob Peterson, he was involved with Incredibles, I think, or, or, or one of those. And now he's co-director with Pete Doctor for this one. And I wouldn't be surprised if he's got the reins of one of those coming up in the future. Disney 2D Animation did that too, though. Right. Where that they had a big team of incredible artists and screenwriters and, and character designers and producers and that. And as they started to make more and more and more releases, each one edited their own film. And they had no clear direction because there were a couple of gems, so to speak, even around the time that the Disney animated films weren't coming out so well. And, and you'd see a mediocre one. Or you'd... You're rambling again, guys. Well, anyway, I, I, I hope that they don't have the same same problems or same mistakes. And it seems like they're in good hands with John Lasseter. That may be the difference. What happened with the Disney 2D animation, they had their Silver Age, and Jeff Katzenberg was in charge of Disney animation at the time. And right as the Silver Age came to an end, he bolted and went to DreamWorks. And then it was like they had nobody to steer the ship. And just got worse and worse and worse. And not to say that I think Katzenberg is that great because everything that he's done since then, I mean, he's had DreamWorks and I'm not a fan, as you know. But perhaps the difference with uh, Pixar is John Lasseter was the man who's been steering the ship from the beginning. And he continues to do so, although he is now in charge of all of Disney's animation that now includes Pixar. And so he's there to keep them on track, whereas Katzenberg was gone and off doing his own Prince of Egypt feature or whatever. Maybe that will save them. I don't know. Well, do you remember when the contract with Disney was running out and there was a lot of talk of somebody else is going to scoop up Pixar uh -huh. and whoever does this is going to be sitting on a gold mine? I, I talked about greed Greed nearly destroyed the Pixar-Disney relationship, yeah. too. And just the focus on let's do the cheap direct-to-video sequels and just squeeze every single drop of blood out of this turnip. And if you can go get some more turnips, honey, uh, it would be nice. It was one of those things where it's like, oh, no, these guys only have one product that is consistently great. And they're about to piss it away. And then somebody... Whoever they were were very inspired, decided to make this awesome deal with Pixar, where not only did Disney keep Pixar, but they gave John Lasseter control over everything. And now we've got Princess and the Frog coming out under Lasseter's okay. direction, and I hope it's great. Me too. I think that there's room for 2D and 3D animation out there, and I hope that the history books look back on this decision to put Lasseter in charge and just say, wow. That was a multi-billion dollar decision that Disney made, and it it's paid off to the nth degree. And I certainly think that it was wise. And again, I'm biased too. I don't know that I'm a Pixar apologist, but I'm a devotee or a zealot or, or, or make up whatever <laughs> funny name you want. I, I have a friend who doesn't particularly like John Lasseter, and I just don't get that. John Lasseter is everything I would want to be. Hawaiian shirts included. <laughs> Yeah, what is that? Everybody at Pixar wears those awful shirts. I think they're cool. Well, hey, you have indulged me for a long, long time. And yes. You've been more than patient with me. And, and I realized from our Nielsen ratings that there is one person who hasn't shut off the MP3. And thank you, Mom. I realize that I'm just talking to hear myself speak, but what else is new? Yeah, that's why the podcast exists in the first place, isn't it? Yes, yes. to serve my every whim. Just, Just like, like you, Doug, who will have, have to, wear to wear the cone of shame. <laughs> but if you'll indulge me, just one more silly thing. And now it's time for Tell Me a Story, Mommy, with Rish Outfield. Oh, yeah. Is that a new feature? Oh, <laughs> yes. It's just a, a new announcement. We've had that feature all along, it turns out. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> See, now the pressure is on because I either have to be entertaining or, wait, maybe you guys are mocking me with that. <laughs> So it doesn't no, matter how no, lame. No, no, we would never mock. Oh, okay. We had just a monstrous glut, a tidal wave, a tsunami of computer animated films in the last five years. And you used to remark to me with disgust that X has made $120 million or Y has opened I with never a saw 35 X. How did that? How did that go? I... 
okay, okay, just substitute the shark tail for X and Dougal for Y, all right? Wow, did Dougal make money? <laughs> Shudder with us, folks. It was just this unbelievable spate of CG movies, and every single one of them made money. And you said it, it, it has surpassed the horror genre or any of those genres of you get a return on investment. It is so cheap to make, and it's a guarantee of, of money. And I said, studies have shown from Cambridge University that it is cheaper to make a feature-length computer-generated film than a porno now. <laughs> I mean, when they started putting computer-generated Saturday morning cartoons, or worse yet, that five-day-a-week Nick Jr. cartoons or something are computer-generated. I mean, it must be cheaper than porn. And there, there was no stopping it. Yeah, it, was just, it didn't matter. You, you would get one a month. You and, put it on film, and it was a, a success. And and some of them, they, they wouldn't even release in theaters, just direct to video, in case there were kids who weren't getting enough with the 12 <laughs> that were being released theatrically that year. You know, the Reef movies we talked about in the Wally episode that just ripped off some other movies. But who cares? We made it in a weekend and one person rented it and we made our money back. Yeah, you and I just hung our head in shame. It's one of those things where there's, there's not anything we can do about it. And then came December 2008. And a movie called Delgo was released. And it's funny, I saw a trailer and it looked so, so bad. And not just bad in a stupid way like so many of them do, but bad in a, oh man, what a misfire. Why would anybody want to see this? I thought, well, I'm going to rush home and I'm going to short this on the Hollywood Stock Exchange because <laughs> holy cow, this is going to be a bomb, man. This isn't going to make $30 million. And I got home and I looked it up and it had come out and already gone. It came out in December of 2008. It had a production budget of $40 million and it made 694000 its entire run. Wow. You know, I've never even heard of this film, Delgo. Sure you've heard about it because I've gone on and on. And it was one of those where the trailer said, Featuring the voice of Anne Bancroft, Jennifer Love Hewitt, and Freddie Prinze Jr. Wow, what a bomb. So that worked out for you on the Hollywood Stock Exchange? No, it didn't because it had oh, already oh, come right. and gone. that's right, you were too late. <laughs> but then, you know, a couple of months later, I saw a trailer, and I swear I thought it was Delgo again. I thought, oh no, what are we seeing this trailer for this movie that went away? And it was for a CG animated film in very much the same vein, and it was called Battle for Terra, uh, with somewhat realistic fantasy situations where Earth had been destroyed, and we're going to take over another planet it and there are all these peaceful aliens there and they're like oh no the humans are coming and the humans are like die <laughs> we are going to destroy your planet like we did to our own and i thought oh no who thought this was a good uh, i've got to stand up in the <laughs> middle of the movie to run home and short the stock you pull out your cell phone. phone and even though you detest people that do that you're just like oh let me get it oh holy cow this one was like featuring the voice of evan yeah, rachel, rachel wood, wood. Luke wilson you know, it's just it was one of those where i thought oh no there's no chance anybody's gonna and i say oh no because I guess I feel sorry for them. I try to be a creative person and put myself in their shoes. Yeah, this is a film that should not have gotten off the ground. And it has come and gone. These are not cheap films to make, porn notwithstanding. They're like a $50 million movie. It has come and gone at $1.6 million, its whole run. And I think with this one-two punch of Delgo and Battle for Terra, the days of Hoodwinked are finally over. <laughs> When a really, really bad, mediocre, crass, talentless, cheap, insipid. Come on, you gotta have more, you gotta have more. A trite, uninspired, raging, uncreative, <laughs> wildly unimaginative <laughs> <laughs> film can come out and expect to do tons of business because of the medium in which it's made because it's computer generated those days are over now it could be that we can see another turd like happily never after come out <laughs> next month 
that it makes $40 million its opening weekend because it's computer animated and somebody says, you know what? That sort of looked like Shrek. Let's go. <laughs> I mean, there is still some of those films. We just said wildly unimaginative, which is a term that comes from a review that you read about monsters versus aliens. And that was up until like a week ago. That was the biggest, the movie. biggest movie of the year. So there's still some of that hanging around. It's going to take more than just a one-two punch, I think, unfortunately. But, but see, that was part of our conversation. The one-two punch of Anastasia and Titan AE crippled Fox Animation Studio. That was it for them, uh -huh. really. Luckily for them, unluckily for me, they were able to do CG movies like Ice Age. But... Yeah. These kind of costly bombs, they're damning for studios. And I, I'm seeing that Lionsgate produced Battle for Terra. And uh, yeah, I don't know. That's probably one of those things where their 2010 slate probably got cut in half when that came out. And I see, I want to feel sorry for them, but whose idea was that? You know, you don't have a Spielberg, a real visionary or somebody that says human beings are bad and they go to another planet where we sympathize with the aliens. And just right there, that one sentence <laughs> is enough where you'd say, oh, no, 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 no. That wouldn't fly on a direct to sci-fi channel film. <laughs> you don't want to do that. Anyhow, I, I've been talking for a long, long time, but, but it, it's funny. You and I, we have certain things that we're passionate about. And I guess this is something we have in common. And one day we may have the topic of conversation be, you know, the legacy that was the XFL. And I'll just sit in silence for the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> well, I expound and expound. You know, there's, that's not possible. There's nothing you can say about the XFL other than it didn't last long. <laughs> and it was a bad idea to begin with. I mean, wrestling all by itself is a bad idea to begin with. And combining that with football, wow. Yeah, the, the, I, I realize that we're all over the page, but uh, Up was a really good film. If you haven't seen it and you like good movies, go see it. Or see it again. Because it's a good movie. If you like crap, well, then don't bother because it's not that. Big and I used to have a professor. He was the, probably the professor that made the biggest impression on me in school, and he used to say, you vote with your dollar, folks. That's right. With everything, really. And yeah, he's like, if you don't like something, then for goodness sake, don't buy it. A lot of people don't. They, they buy it and then complain. <laughs> and if you like something, but you think, let's rent it on video or let's download it illegally or let's do whatever, <laughs> you know, have my friend lend me his, you're choosing Keeping not to vote money. with your dollar. The fact that so many people went to see Up and is great. It, it gives me hope for humanity because people go see that movie in my mind, they're not going to go home and beat their kids and, go, you know, <laughs> shoot up and, you know, text message through the middle of it and get a tattoo. All the things that are worst in life. It's, it's, it's a movie that can make people better. <laughs> nice. All right. So that was our show. And thank you for listening all through our conversation. Thank you, Michael Stone, for sending a story. Thank you for reading. Thank you for submitting. Thank you. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rish Outfield. Through the force, things. You oh, hey, see. hey, Rish, Rish, Other Rish. Places. Rish. Hey, I did that Google search. I Google searched the Dune Steef. Oh, okay. Um, it looks like the Dune Steef is an audio fiction magazine. Oh. Uh, probably sucks, too. <sighs> you have no idea. Good night. <laughs> Good night, folks. Thank you for listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. The Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine is published under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. You may share these files with anyone, but you may not charge for them or alter them. Take two. Wilson, the psychiatrist, speculated that my id, due to feelings of guilt at natural puri puri <laughs> prurience, the natural prurience. Thank you, Wilson. Why don't you admit that you're dying to give her one? And I'm talking about... Try that again. Some of that meat oh, she awesome. likes the taste of. Gagging. Why do I love it? <laughs> A girly calendar hung behind Big Zack's head. A nurse with infeasible breath. <laughs>
a nurse with infeasible breasts was doing something or <laughs> I love it. I'm telling you, the bike's got a great, bloody, great, great, bloody, bloody puddle. I, I am a soccer fan. I think I've mentioned this before. So I do hang out here and there with with people who, you know, it, it seems like... With hoodlums? Yeah, hoodlums. No, Sorry, with, with hooligans, hooligans. yes. I, I do hang out with hooligans on occasion. And it seems like there's a lot of people that they feel like if they like soccer, then they have to start using English phrases and... Stuff like that. If you're not a mank, so, you're a wank. <laughs> so you'll hear. <laughs> that makes me laugh. It makes me think of all the crap that we we did for uh, uh, Club yesterday. Where you go, hey, Manchester United. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cut that out, O-O-T. Because that, that, that doesn't come up for 10 episodes or so. Um, damn, now I've lost my train of thought. I hate when that happens because it's going to sound, sound bad when we edit it. <laughs> Okay, you were saying that oh, yes. soccer fans feel it necessary. So yeah, they they soccer fans. I've found that they get, once they get enough into soccer, they feel like they need to say English phrases, and so they'll say crap like "Good on ya," and oh, I, that was the worst thing. I was looking on one of those soccer message boards, and this guy was talking about being a soccer fan in America, how hard it is, and he was saying, you know. We soccer fans in America have to put up with ever so much crap. And, I just thought, <laughs> and he did it twice in like the same post. I'm like, dude, you said ever so much more than once. What is wrong with you? You are an American. Do they even say that like outside of Mary Poppins or something? I like pornography ever so much. <laughs> it's just, yeah, you have to be like freaking Oliver Twist or something to be saying ever so much all the time. But, uh, yeah.